You know, what is important to you? What, what brings you happiness? Here's something that's not in any notes this morning. This is just random. If you're watching online, under the tent, or here in person, anybody that's close to you, you can put your mask on if you need to, I want you to just tell that person that you're thankful for them and that you love them. Even if you don't really know them that well, just do that for a second, would you? Is that person next to you? I don't really believe we as a, a, a world do that enough just to take time and to affirm each other and appreciate one another. And that's so important. That's part of what brings us happiness. So I sent out a message through Group Me, and I know a lot of you don't get the Group Me, but I sent it out yesterday evening. And the, the thing that I sent out is this. We've got a slide here. Have you gained any insight or made new or healthy choices during this crazy COVID pandemic? Have you? I don't think Pamela and Jacob and Tom could have done a better job in that video of really summarizing, you know, how life has changed for them and how they made the best of this time of, of being together, you know. And so I want to share with you just three perspectives from me. The first one is realize that every single minute of your life counts. Every single minute. And I have learned to use time more wisely. Don't take the time that you have for granted. More importantly, and on the contrary, learning to, to just be simply, just simply be. Just be. Do you know what that means? Every minute does not have to be filled with productive and life-altering accomplishments. We think we always got to be going and doing something. And many times we just need to be still in the presence of God. Take a deep breath and ask the question, God, what are you trying to teach me here? What do you want me to learn? How do you want me to best live this life that you've given me? Am I making a difference? Or am I in a routine, caught in a rut, because I think I need to do this and that? I need to keep up with these people and, and please these people. Remember several weeks ago, I mentioned to you that we are not to please people. The only one that we are to please is God himself. He's truly the only one that matters. And if we will please God, I can almost assure you, and it's not an almost, I can assure you, that people will be pleased. And for those who are not pleased with you when you're trying to please God, they've got something going on with themselves. They're struggling with something. I could spend a lot of time because I have a lot of training in this sort of thing as a pastoral care clinician, but I'm not going to go there right now. But I am going to give you some secrets today to truly being happy. That's why I believe each time you worship with us, whether it's online, in person, wherever you are, that God is transforming you through his word, through this church. And so, my third thing, it's okay and healthy to breathe, to be present, and to rest in God's presence. To be still and know that I am God. Along with be anxious for nothing. That's taking home a brand new perspective for me. I mean, how many of you are just constantly anxious and, and nervous and on edge? God doesn't want you to be that way. He wants you to relax and take a deep breath and relish in him and the, and the blessings that he's given you in your life. To appreciate that, not take those blessings for granted, and enjoy the moments you have with your friends and your family. And don't get so caught up in everything else that really doesn't make much of a difference. And whenever you have the opportunity, speak life over people. You know, I said this last week, if you reprimand your children, maybe even your spouse occasionally, you know, always after the reprimand, reaffirm. You ought to write that down. Remember that. I did that yesterday. I reprimanded my son for something. Actually, it was the day before. And then right after that, he's watching this morning. He's, not, he's got a headache this morning. Been staying out too late. But I um, just, just told his mama she didn't know that. Um, <laughs> um, and, I, and I reprimanded him for something. But right after that, I reaffirmed him. Instead of tearing him down, I built him back up. Do you see what I'm saying about that? Just give some of those things a thought. You know, people spend their lives searching for happiness 
and pleasure, the next best thing to do. I don't even know what the word bored means, but I hear that word and it makes me cringe. I have never been bored in my entire life. <laughs> but I hear people say, I'm bored. I'm like, you know, when I hear that, and this is terrible to think, but I think in my mind, I just need to slap him, you know? <laughs> bored, I got some stuff. You need some stuff to do? Come on over to my house. Got plenty to do. You know, bored, what does that mean? Always got to be doing something. It's like the young man who was talking to his dad, and he says, I'm looking for adventure, excitement, and beautiful women. And don't try to stop me, Dad. Who wants to stop you, said the father. I'm going with you. <laughs> there are some pleasure seekers out there. I mean, that's what they live for, the next pleasure. You know, think about Solomon in the Bible, supposedly one of the wisest, most godly men ever, and yet he seemed never to be satisfied. You know, in Ecclesiastes, the first two chapters, you can take a look at that this afternoon, there's an example of what he's trying to do. He's celebrated for his wisdom, but he tells of his search through those whole first two chapters of trying to find happiness. The, the first words we encounter in the opening of the book of Ecclesiastes are this, meaningless, meaningless. That's what he says, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's what he says. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, I quoted theologian Paul Tillich, and he said, the greatest fear of society is meaninglessness. Solomon was a wise man. He had all the resources and the riches you could imagine, but he was not happy. He thought that he could find happiness through his intellectual pursuits. You know, and there are a lot of people who are intellectual. I mean, they have got the brain power, and they try to reason everything. They're the brightest people in their field, but that doesn't mean that they're very happy and that they're content. No, they're not. Solomon says this, I've increased in my wisdom more than anybody else, more than anybody that's ever ruled over Jerusalem, but I learned this, I'm only chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. That's interesting, don't you think? The more knowledge, the more grief. Knowledge didn't bring him happiness. Wisdom didn't bring him happiness. Solomon followed an entirely different path, sensual pleasure. He said to himself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless for him. Then he tried laughter. And he says, laughter, it's madness. Nothing makes me happy, one translation says. What does pleasure accomplish, he says. Then he says, I tried the path of alcohol, cheering myself with wine, he writes. But this also produced frustration. And then he notes in Proverbs 1, verse 20, wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. That's in the Bible, folks. How can that be? I mean, all these young people in these beer commercials, man, they look happy having a good time, right? But look what he says. And it didn't do anything for Solomon. Then he turned to constructive activities. He says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I, for myself, and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and, and parks and planted all kinds of trees. Still, he didn't find satisfaction. From that, Solomon turned to the accumulation of wealth. I bought male and female slaves. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and princes. Still, Solomon did not find what he was seeking. Then he tried it, and I'm going to say it, that word, the three-letter word, then he tried, Solomon tried, sex in a variety of forms. Let me just say this. He says, I acquired male and female singers and harem as well, the delights of a man's heart, a thousand wives and concubines, yet I was still unfulfilled, he says. Solomon lived life larger than anybody that came before him. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes did not, my, desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. His pleasure-seeking experience were eventually summed up in these plaintive words. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing gained under the sun. He reached the point. This is King Solomon. He reached the point where he wrote later in the same chapter, So I hated life, 
all of its meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. Wow, what a sad, miserable man. He had everything that life could offer. And he counted it all as vanity. Solomon had everything the human heart could desire except one. I'll let you guess what that was. As he read his litany of despair, I couldn't help but see many people today who are chasing happiness in a similar fashion. Knowledge, alcohol, sensual pleasure, work, accumulation of wealth, sex, popularity, the number of followers that I have, the number of friends that I have. Who wants to stop you? said the father of the young man leaving the house. I'm going with you, son. I'm going to go search for all those things with you. Let's live it up. Let's have some fun because that's what life is all about, right? Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And yet I know for a fact, every weekend, some people start as early as Thursday, there are people who are making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> Granola bars, putting them in the bag, mints, crackers, Cheez-Its, potato chips, a little napkin in there, you know. I know people who are busy and got a lot to do, but yet they were the first ones to sign up to go and get school supplies, and they didn't worry that it was going to cost a good bit because, it, honestly, it did cost a good bit if you got everything, especially for the high schoolers. And not only did you go out and get everything, but you got decent backpacks to go with them, not the little El Cheapos. And you filled those backpacks with amazing things, and you put notes on those bags you know, that's, that's pleasure. That's pleasure that lasts for eternity. That's pleasure that makes a difference. That's pleasure that counts. You might not see that child or that person you made the lunch for or, or got the school supplies for, but God does, and God sees what you're doing, and he will reward you. I'm not talking about the kind of reward you may think, but he'll reward you in a way that will totally captivate you and blow your mind. There will be a blessing that comes across you that you're like, whoa, that was a God, a God wink maybe. God did that. Wow. And you may not even realize it or it dawned on you. It's because of you helped somebody else, you served somebody else, you, you spoke life to somebody. That's what true pleasure and satisfaction is. It's not all about what you can get and what you want and what fulfills your carnal desires. It's about what you can give. That's what brings happiness. You're getting the formula today. Give equals happiness. St. Paul saw this same emptiness that Solomon had in people over and over and over. He saw it in the early Christian believers. That's why he wrote, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. When I was watching Pamela in that video, Everything she said, she was making the most of every opportunity she had during this quarantine. Good for her. My question is to you is, are you making the most of this opportunity you have? If not, it's time, isn't it? He says this, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand the Lord's will. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the God, our Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I got to say this. Were we not getting our worship on this morning with our worship team? Amazing. You not just sense and feel the power of God, His Spirit, when you're here, when you're worshiping the living God. You want to know why that is? It's because every person in our worship team is prayed over each week. They may not even know that. They're prayed over. God, feel them, use them, minister to us through them. And it happens every single time. If you're not doing that, if you're not praying for these servants, if you're not praying for your pastor, please do it. Every day, pray for us. I pray for you. Many of you, I pray by, by name. I pray for your, your family members. Even your cousins, if I know them, and uncles and aunts, if I know them. If there's a situation, we pray, and we remember you, and we know that God hears those prayers. There are two keys that St. Paul gives us that leads to lasting happiness. First of all, be smart with your life. 
<laughs> be smart with your life. Be careful then how you live, he's right, he says. Not as unwise, but as wise, making, ev- making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Does it seem like the days are evil? Does it seem like evil is in our world? You know? And, and people will say, oh, that's not evil. They're not evil. That's just them. No. There's something making them evil. There's something that they've given into. They've given into the world. They've given into their flesh. They've given into mockery and debauchery and other things that are of the flesh, not of God and not of the Spirit. I could spend a lot of time on that. But be careful, be wise, live smart. And so we keep learning from St. Paul here. He says, I'm concerned about you getting drunk. I'm concerned about you ruining your life. That's what he's basically saying. Now, I'm not concerned that many of you will, will go, you know, be a part of debauchery. But alcohol abuse is still a problem in our society, especially on college campuses. And you better believe it. I know this. I was in adolescent ministry and young adult ministry for a long time. You want to know how people drown their sorrows? We're saying, yes, Lord, I'm trading my sorrows, you know, with the Lord. You know how some people drown their sorrows? It's alcohol and other things and addictive behavior. And when you're socially isolated, when you're behind a computer screen instead of in a classroom with people, when you can't be around others, then those addictions become awfully attractive to be a part of. So let's be praying for that too. It is a problem. It's destructive. He says, be careful, Paul says, be careful how you live your life. I know that's simple, but it's some of the best advice we'll ever hear. And it could be applied to substances that we put into our bodies or a host of other unwise situations in which we might place ourselves. In other words, don't be stupid. St. Paul would like that. Don't be stupid. There are many people today involved in risky behaviors that are dangerous to their health, dangerous to their marriages, dangerous to their reputation in the community. Some are so dangerous that they die. It's the truth. In 1991, Mario Van Peebles directed a motion picture titled New Jack City. I don't know if you ever saw that. I did. Which contains a scene in which a character accepts some illegal drugs. When the scene was shown at a theater in New York City, an African-American man stood up and yelled at the screen, Just say no, man! Say no! Mr. Van Peebles, who was present in the theater at that time, says that this is one of the best things he has ever witnessed in his life. It may be that this man who yelled at the movie screen had been down the road of illegal drugs himself and wanted to warn everybody else what a dumb move it was. Be careful how you live, says the Apostle Paul. It is said that John Morley once traveled from England to Canada to address the graduating class of the university. He began his speech by saying, I've traveled over 4,000 miles to tell you the difference between wrong and wrong and right. Of course there's a difference. And every sensible person knows it's true. If it is in any way hurtful to you or someone else, it's wrong. If what you're going to post or what you're going to write or what you're going to say is going to hurt somebody, it's wrong. That's truth, ladies and gentlemen. That's a biblical truth. Do good Do no harm. Stay in love with God. Adhere to his ordinances, which are all throughout his his scriptures and his word. If what you're doing keeps you from fulfilling your potential as a follower in Christ, keep your distance. If it causes you to feel ashamed as you look in the mirror, if you go to bed at night thinking about it and there's guilt, God doesn't want that for you. So stop it. Get that out of your life. Don't do anything dumb. Sounds like I'm talking to teenagers, doesn't it? Just don't do anything dumb, you know? (laughs) Doug and Sherry are going to drop Bella off at school. Don't do anything dumb. (laughs) I have a feeling they're going to say something like, remember who you are and whose you are. We love you. We're always here for you. That's the truth from this church, too. We do love you, and we're always here for you. Somebody's always praying for you. And all of our students out there, whether they're going away to college or school or in their, you know, at the kitchen table on the computer doing virtual school, wherever they're at, we love you, and we're praying for you. Do you know who Chuck Swindoll is? He's a great speaker. A lot of us listen to him on the radio. 
He tells about this scheme that happened in New York City years ago. Some con men decided to make some extra money by feeding on corrupt nature. They got a pile of cardboard boxes and some newspapers and some stickers and that read factory sealed and a roll of bubble plastic and a stack of stolen shopping bags from Macy's. They stuffed each box with bricks and newspaper until it weighed a couple of pounds and then wrapped everything in bubble wrap and affixed these stickers on the boxes. The con artist started wandering the curb carrying the bogus boxes inside the Macy's shopping bags. When they spotted a potential buyer stranded in traffic, they walked up to the car window and started fast-talking a cash deal. Hey, man, I got a Sony Handycam here just off the FedEx truck. He lifts the box out of the bag saying, Macy's sells them for $999. Then jerking his head around nervously, he says, I'll take 90 bucks cash. The car starts to edge forward, and then the other drivers start yelling. The thief delivers his final pitch. Okay, man, I'll let you have it for $45. Take it or leave it. And the driver takes it, knowing it's hot merchandise. Now, when these con artists were asked how it feels to rip people off, selling them empty boxes, one of the men justified his actions by saying, Hey, man, I'm not beating an honest man. No one buys something hot unless they've got larceny in their heart. Mmm. And Swindoll goes on to say, The guy's got a point. The fellow who grabbed the box and sped off into the night was just as guilty as the thief on the street. And along with that, his money gave hearty approval to the one who ripped him off. Happens all the time, doesn't it? The details change, but it's depravity on display. Furthermore, no one's immune. In fact, the possibilities of appealing to old nature, our old nature, are endless. You know, we're new creations in Christ, but sometimes we are teased by our old nature and we slip back into that. We see something, we hear something, we smell something, we have an opportunity to take a sip of something and we start getting back into our old nature and we shrivel before it and the guilt enters back in. Don't do anything stupid or dumb. Don't return back to that old way of doing things. This new life that you're living of giving and serving and worshiping the living God. It is the life. It is the way that leads to eternity. And if you believe in Jesus Christ and you follow him and you're serving him, you have that promise of eternity within you right now, this very moment. You know, we don't use the word sin very much anymore. You don't hear it very much. And yet our basic nature hasn't changed since the time of Adam. Suffice it to say, don't do anything stupid. If, someone, if something smells wrong, or somebody smells wrong, if something smells wrong, it usually is. He says, be very careful how you live. That's what Paul says. Not unwise, but as wise. Making every opportunity of the days, because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is is why are people sinning like they are why do they keep doing it because it's all about them fully surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ means you surrender all that you have all that you own you hold nothing back and you take what you own and what you have and you offer it to the Lord whatever that may be think about it wow you know you may have seen the movie on Netflix starring Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye, White Christmas. You ever seen that movie? It's a great movie. It's the delightful motion picture. Bing Crosby introduced Irving Berlin songs in that movie. He, inter- he introduced another one besides White Christmas that's touched people over the years. It goes something like this. When I am troubled and cannot sleep, I count my blessings instead of sheep, and I fall asleep counting my blessings. That's something we can learn from. Fall asleep counting your blessings, praising God, quoting the Psalms rather than listing off the things you got to do, the worries that you have. Just start praising Him, quoting the Psalms, any scripture that's on your heart, and you'll fall off to sleep and you'll rest. I know it sounds trite, but the happiest people I know are people who are filled with gratitude and giving thanks. It doesn't mean that they're materially blessed or that their health is exceptional, or that their children are straight-A students and captains of the football team. It simply means that they have learned to count the blessings they do have and have learned to say, thank you, thank you. In 2008, a young Australian mother 
of three named Haley Bartholomew was feeling really down. She had an envious life, including beautiful kids and a loving husband, but she felt disappointed with her life. She finally decided to do something about her condition. She consulted with a nun who counseled her to make time every passing day to look around her and find something that makes her grateful for life. So take time, just look around at the things that make you grateful for life. That's what she told her. So Haley started a project she christened called 365 Grateful, taking pictures of the things which made her feel grateful every day. It didn't take long for her outlook on life to be transformed. For example, before she initiated this practice, she had convinced herself that her husband was not very romantic. But this view changed when she took photographs of him serving dinner to the family. For the first time since they got married, Haley noticed that her husband served her the largest piece of pie. It was his gentle way of showing his affection for her. She took other pictures of her husband outside playing basketball with the kids. She took other pictures of her husband just randomly taking the dry clothes out of the dryer and folding them. You ever heard of a man doing that? But he did it. She took pictures of him outside cutting grass and weed eating, doing things. She took pictures of him getting up early on Saturday morning and fixing pancakes and bacon and all the sides and making her her only special waffle. She took pictures of her kids running up the driveway after school with their backpacks, excited to be home. And you know what happened? She began to realize, oh my goodness, I am so loved. I have so much to be thankful for. I have a, a wonderful life. Maybe that's something you ought to try. You know? Give it a shot. Take some pictures of somebody doing something. Don't let them know you're doing it. And then show them and tell them thank you for what you do and what you mean to us, what you mean to me and what you mean to our family. You know, this joy and happiness she saw in her kids and her, and her husband changed her life radically she came out of that rut she had a new life G.K. Chesterton once wrote the test of all happiness is gratitude and he's right now let's go back to Solomon who experienced every earthly pleasure yet something was missing from his life he was a miserable man have you guessed what it was that was missing from his life he had never learned to say thank you. Even though he had a mountain of what other people would count as blessings, he didn't even have what he really needed the most, a grateful heart. I hope you're not making the same mistake. St. Paul writes, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right now, this very moment, wherever you are, watching online, under the tent, in this building, I want you to lift your hands with me. Just lift them up. If you're able to do that, you might have a shoulder issue and you can't. So as high as you can. And I just want you to pour out your heart to the Lord. Express your gratitude in, to Him. Just silently do that. For the people He's blessed you with, the people in your life, for the experiences you've had these last several months or maybe years that maybe you've taken for granted. Give Him praise and thank Him. Thank Him for His goodness and His grace and His mercy and His love. As you give thanks, pour out that gratitude, you're going to feel more and more happy and joy. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this community. Thank you for this worship team. Thank you for our sound folks and our media folks, visual folks. Thank you for those who set up each week, for, for those who teach our Sunday school classes and our small groups and our men's studies and our women's studies and work with our youth group and our, our children, Lord. 
Lord, thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to continue to do, because we know you're making a way when there seems to be no way. And we say, yes, Lord, we trade our sorrows and our pains for the joy of the Lord, and we do this by expressing our gratitude for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.